I want to thank everybody who um, had anything to do with this. I am um, really moved, and I can't adequately tell you what a great honor it is for me to be named the first Beth Shulman Fellow. I was such an admirer of Beth and her work for a long time, and I've always been an admirer and have come increasingly to depend upon the work of the National Employment Law Project. Um, the research, the background, it was um, through NELP that I first heard about um, this uh, treacherous idea of um, employers discriminating against the long-term unemployed. Um, just one more outrageous thing that America's workers have to put up with. But also, Beth was a uh, senior fellow at Demos, where I am now, and uh, so there are a lot of convergences here. And I am beyond proud uh, to accept this fellowship. Beth was an expert on an issue that I've become all but obsessed with, and that's employment. Workers in America have been getting a raw deal on employment, as all of you know, for the longest time. We ship our good jobs overseas, and we look around and wonder why so many people are unemployed. We make trade agreements with foreign countries that hobble American workers and that hurt their families. And then we don't even require those foreign countries to abide by the rules and the regulations of those agreements. Employers refuse to share the benefits of their workers' increased productivity. And then we wonder why so many American families are struggling. Six million manufacturing jobs, one third of the entire sector, good jobs, disappeared from 2000 to 2010. Another two million construction jobs were destroyed when the housing market crashed and burned. The average length of unemployment in the United States now is close to a backbreaking six months. A third of the 14 million men and women officially classified as unemployed have been out of work for more than a year. For all the attention it's getting now, joblessness in America is still a much bigger problem than most people realize. That lack of work for the people who want and so desperately need it is a raging crisis and there is no end in sight. It's not terrorism or some foreign foe that is the greatest threat to America as we've come to know it. It's the long dark night of chronic unemployment. But here, But here's the thing, and here's where best voice was so important. We have a tendency to think that, hey, we can, if we can manage to get the unemployment rate down and put a certain number of people back to work in a given month, then all will be well. But that's not true. The official unemployment rate was pretty low by historic standards before the Great Recession. But Beth was out there even then sounding the alarm. And she was out there because we weren't doing the right thing by so many people who, in fact, already had jobs. Too many people were working at jobs that didn't pay enough, that didn't pay them a fair wage. Long before the recession, Beth was writing, 25% of our nation's workers own, earn less than $870 an hour or $18,000 a year before taxes or health insurance which puts a family of four under the federal poverty wage. It was wrong, she told us, to try and justify the poverty and the meager benefits of those workers by characterizing the workers themselves as unskilled or undereducated. They were, in fact, doing work that was absolutely essential to our society. The problem was not that these workers were unskilled, it was that they were underpaid. As we all know, matters have gotten far worse economically since then. In the tough times and the anxiety and the perpetual struggle that was always part of the daily life of low-wage workers is now increasingly part of the daily life of people who thought themselves solidly anchored in the middle class. Beth saw this coming just as she had sounded the alarm about what was happening with low-wage workers. She knew that the unfairness and the way that they were being treated was spreading in this country. She told us that we should be concerned as well about the fact that low-wage jobs have become the fastest-growing job category 
in the United States, and that was a threat to the middle class as well as to low-wage workers. Back in 2004, three years before the recession, Beth was warning that manufacturing and other jobs that once provided a middle-class income for millions of American families were in fact disappearing. Increasingly, people were trading in their so-called good jobs for low-wage work with few or no benefits. One of the things that Beth wanted was for us to upgrade the quality of those jobs and to view them in a different light. She would tell us that there was nothing inherent in welding bumpers onto cars or manufacturing steel girders that made them better jobs than, say, caring for children or working as a nurse's aide or a teacher's assistant or being a home health aide or a retail salesperson or a janitor. She explained to us that the manufacturing jobs that played such a crucial role in building the middle class were once terrible jobs themselves. They paid little and the working conditions were often atrocious and even life-threatening. But workers organizing through unions and the passage of social legislation raised wages and created paid leave and health and retirement benefits for those initially bad jobs and changed them into solid middle-class employment. Beth wanted us to raise the pay and improve the working conditions in today's so-called bad jobs, first and foremost, because it was the right thing to do. No worker should be exploited. But we needed to raise the quality and the pay of those jobs because, because we needed to do it for the good of society. We need to keep our individuals and our families whole, all of them. And we need to keep them whole and able to support themselves. And they have to be able also to sustain an economy that works for the rest of us, an economy that works for all Americans. We miss Beth. But in my work, I'm guided, as so many of you are, by her insight and her counsel every day. I'm often asked when I go around speaking, to, you know, is there anything we need, we could be optimistic about? There's so much bad news. Sure, there's something we could be optimistic about, and I would tell them to look around this room at all the work that all you guys are doing. That's a great reason for optimism. Thank you so much.